This is Abe Freetanzer from Awards Radar, and I'm so thrilled to be speaking with Theo James about The White Lotus. How are you, Theo? I'm good, thanks, Ben. How are you doing? Good, good. What was your experience with a knowledge of season one before coming on board for season two? Um, well, I was just I happened to be talking about this just now. Uh, I loved the first season, watched it just as a fan. Um, and in a way, we were lucky in season two because we had already seen season one uh, and we knew what we were getting into, as it were, because, the, you know, Mike's writing is so acute, but his tone and the specificity of the world and it's it's both comedic and dramatic and it's both very a lot of naturalism coupled with quite a, a heightened energy you know we, we having being able to enjoy and see the first season uh enabled you know the actors to really relax into the into the tone of it in a role like that of cameron seems like it could be very juicy but also sort of unappealing just because there's a there's a lot not to like about him do you agree with that assessment pure juice that's how with cameron um <laughs> i think i relish the idea of playing you know the, the villain um and also i i felt i'd met a version of of him in varying different ways along you know in my life um so I, I thought, I, 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 yeah, I, re I really enjoyed the challenge of him, but also the challenge of, of making him, trying to make him uh, within the paradigm of his toxicity and these fairly um, ludicrous opinions and, and, you know, entitlements that he has, trying to make him as, as charming and likable within that prism as possible. And, and that was the thing, you know, that I was acutely aware of you know and mike white was too you, you, he needs to be as charming as possible otherwise he's just repugnant you know whereas if he's both those things then it's it's far more interesting and far more juicy as, to use your uh, description you think he has any redeeming qualities i do I, you know you try and you you have to like for me, at least, you have to, even the worst character you're playing, you have to find a way of empathizing with them and understanding them. And that sounds kind of pretentious, but it's it's true. If you have no in, way into the character, then you're not going to bring anything that's in any way truthful to it. And sometimes as actors, you know, you things come to you or you, you're thinking of trying to go for something and you have to remind yourself that perhaps you there isn't there isn't a there isn't a piece of this character that you know enough and as a result perhaps you're not the best person to play it so that's a kind of roundabout way of saying i i liked i i, I could see rede rede redeeming qualities in him or at least i tried to find them those being he's affable and he's very loving i think he loves his wife he loves ethan in this very strange toxic friendship way he 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 loves life, you know, and those are the things that I anchored on to to try and make him as fun as possible, uh, despite his, you know, his competitivity, his cruelty, his uh, gaslighting of Ethan, you know, all this thing. I do think that his relationship with Daphne is not the least healthy relationship on this show, which is which is interesting. What was it like working with Megan? <laughs> yeah, not the least, uh, even though it's pretty unhealthy. Megan, uh, Megan's a dream. Uh, she is hugely collaborative, really fun. Um, we really w w were very aware of, of wanting them to be as natural and tactile and easy in one another's company as possible, because certainly at the beginning of the season, you're supposed to set up these privileged white in love you know almost too um too much uh how how into the, each other they are even though there's this kind of a, an opaque truth to that so so we yeah we kind of worked on it as much as possible we wanted them to be as comfortable within each other's presence as possible to make it feel as real as possible but she's you know Megan, megan's great she's also got the ability to play both you know on a dime she can switch to kind of cathartic drama and then back into comedic bitsy you know so it's it's it's, it's a real she's she's a real talent you and will sharp also both have very uh convincing american accents and i'm curious if you think it matters that your characters are american or if it would come off differently if, if they were if they were english 
Interesting question. I think, yes, it would have changed things. I, I think, firstly, with the British accent, there is, you know, with an American TV show, there's the allure of something different, something foreign. Secondly, I think British accents are so linked to, to class and wealth that perhaps if, if Cameron, say, had been British, he might have been too you know, on the nose, evil. Uh, also, Cameron specifically represents um, a very specific part of white American Americana. You know, he's, he probably, he, he you know, he came from money. He went to a good school by right. Um, he goes straight into the good merchant banking job where he's slapped on the back by other white men around him and he's coaxed into the world that he perceives should be, that is owed to him anyway. So I, I think um, he, he, wouldn't, he, he, he's, he needed to be American in a way as part of the message, the message, but a part of the story. I also like the scenes you share with Aubrey Plaza. They just sort of sparkle with this very intense uh, electricity. What is it like working with her? You know, she's a great actress, great comedian. I think the fun of that is they are very different, you know, people. Um, but A, she longs for something that perhaps is missing in her marriage, uh, you know, her character and, and Will's character. B, you know, one of the themes of the show, and it, it was also in this first season, is about humans being... Um, unpack to their most base desires and their most the most base instincts you know fight flight yeah freedom fuck whatever it is um and to her and in the show in a way i always thought he represents the animal you know and, and that is both repugnant to her and really enticing you know i think those two things are they're, they're opposing forces in her own um understanding of self and he represents something that's so gross but also so yeah, highly addictive and uh, sexually heightened in a way that perhaps she hasn't she hasn't uh, met or been in contact her character with men like that before I also feel like the characters in the show are fairly siloed to their own plot lines, but you do get an opportunity, even if it's somewhat brief, to interact with some of the Italians on the show. Was it nice to sort of step into into that other aspect of the storyline? Yeah, and and again, to all of them, great great actors, and they, you know, that whole sequence was over. Was it two or three kind of night shoots? Um, so uh, it it was fun, but would but, but also the underlying darkness is interesting there. I think you know on one hand, in the most simple way, it's a kind of party getting fucked up uh, montage. But what I thought was really interesting was um the the, the way it was lit at the end of that sequence has. Cameron, the girls, in a kind of overly lit, slightly depressing looking hotel room. And you hear Cameron, you know, bollocking on in the background. And then you, you cut to um, Ethan and he's kind of looking on, you know, is it, is it voyeurism? Is it, is it intrigue? Is it repulsion? All those things. Um, so, so you begin a sequence in a kind of quite fun electric way, but you end it in kind of uh, a, a flat light, quite sad way. And I think that's quite emblematic of the show in a good way. You know, it, it's um, it's not what you first think it is. It's much uh, darker than that. Yeah. Is there another character you would have liked to have Cameron interact with for some reason, but didn't happen in season two? Um. Adam DeMarco's character, you know, he's such a sweet kid. I think uh, Cameron would have corrupted him, um, maybe, yeah. We've seen a few cast members who are, you know, either have come back or will come back for future seasons. Do you think there's more to Cameron's story or do you feel like it's sort of wrapped up nicely? He's going to have his own show, actually. It's called Cam. Uh, it's like an ABC sitcom. Um, 
No, I uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think that the the brilliance of the, these characters is they play with real longevity because my guess they ability to write them like that. Um, you know, in terms of, I don't think the next season perhaps Cameron wouldn't fit into that world, but um, but Mike is able to write these characters with, with with enough depth that they they all have longevity. I think. Have there been any surprising reactions to Cameron that you've read or heard of from people you know in your own life? Um. I think people have been surprised that they like him, even though they hate him. <laughs> I think people, friends and family have been surprised that, you know, because he is villainous in his um, essence, really. I mean, he's he's manipulating people around him and, and doing pretty, on the, you know, bold and nefarious things. But I think people were shocked to find that they kind of, they, they warm to him in a strange way, even though uh, they find him a bit repulsive. I also watched you on another HBO show where I think you're taking your clothes off a lot more, but for a very different reason, and that's The Time Traveler's <laughs> Wife. Um, is there anything you think that links these two roles, aside from the fact that they both happen to be on, on HBO? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I think The Time Traveler's Wife is about, you know, morality and uh, love over time I think uh, the White Lotus is you know it's it's more about the toxicity of privilege and wealth and I think that's what Cameron represents you know um, the assumption that wealth brings in it and that's what Mike does well in the first season as well he unpacks that the kind of because privilege is there's a gamut of what privilege represents you know and, and we have it or come in contact with a hyper privilege and but the way he unpacks it is really interesting it's 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 about by right you know i should be and i should have x and i should have y because of the world i was brought into you know um i think that's really interesting although there's there's definitely a uh, i always there's a there's a again I, I think there's a warmth to Cameron which is interesting I think he he, he loves unashamedly you know I think he 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 um is full of life and love and that's what makes him interesting you know I, I always thought saw the two of them but particularly Cameron but him and Daphne is they they eat and consume everything around them and and that can be both toxic or it can be both kind of positive and elated. They want to taste everything. They want to, whether it's food or wine or sex or water or sun or, you know, they, they, they want to bring everything to them. And, and that can be dangerous, but also very kind of alluring. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Theo, for taking a few minutes to speak with you today. It's it's good to get to dive into the I, show. I was trying I... to talk in sound bites because I know we only had like <laughs> a very short time. But um, yeah, really good to chat to you, man. And what are all those notes on the very well collated notes in the back? These are some uh, movie stubs from uh, high school and before for me. Oh, nice. Very cool. Fucking awesome. Thank all you. right, man. Very nice to meet you, Theo. Thanks so much. See you, buddy. Bye.